Good morning, and thank you for joining us for our webinar today, the 2015-2016 Crop Outlook. I'm Jim Mintert, Director of the Purdue Center for uh, Commercial Agriculture, and joining me today are my colleagues, Corrine Alexander, a Purdue Extension Economist, and Chris Hurt, also a Purdue Extension Economist. And we're gonna spend the next hour or so with you visiting about the details with respect to the various factors influencing the outlook for corn and soybean prices over the course of the next year, and also discuss some management strategies that you might think about as well. So uh, if you have some questions during the course of the program today, uh, simply email those to me here at my Purdue address, jmintert at purdue.edu, and I will be monitoring that email during the course of the program. We'll try and address your questions during the program, uh, but if you have a question that we're not able to address, we'll try and respond to that uh, later today uh, by a direct email back to you. So if you have a question, don't hesitate to, to go ahead and shoot that to us by way of email. Let's talk a little bit about why grain prices are lower. Kareen, and you've thought about this a lot. We were discussing this in my office the other day. Why don't you walk through a little bit the, the various factors that have really caused grain prices to change a lot, especially over the last year. Right, there's been a very big change in where grain prices have been, and actually it's been the last couple years. Um, so if we think <clears throat> about it, uh, we are now in a situation where uh, the world supply has started to outpace demand growth. Um, and that's been a pretty big change. We had been in a period where supply was substantially smaller to where demand was, but that has shifted completely, and we are now in a world where the world supply is larger than world demand. Uh, in addition to that, we see a situation where acreage globally is continuing to grow, and U.S. and global yields this year were very, very good in 2015, following the 2014 year, which was an extremely good year. So at the end of the day, we're seeing those world inventories for soybeans and wheat go up. What you see in the table below is that um, for corn, soybeans, and wheat globally, all of those prices, as supplies have grown, those prices have gotten weaker. We've moved from corn being $4.46 in 2013 to only $3.75 in 2015. Um, soybeans, that uh, drop has been larger from $13 a bushel to $9.15, and for wheat from $6.87 to $5 a bushel. And the next slide really um, shows that story. That red bar at the top, this is a slide of the world stocks to use ratio. So where are global inventories relative to usage? Um, that top red line there is where wheat uh, global inventories are, and you can see at 31.6%, we are at substantial world inventories of wheat, and that's the highest levels that we've seen since the early 2000s. Soybeans, it's the same sort of story, that 27.4% um, global stocks uh, to use ratio is very, very generous and growing, um, so that means there's plenty of soybeans out there. Uh, on corn, we're seeing that that's down a little bit from last year, 19.2% relative to 20%, but that current global stocks to use ratio of 19% is substantially higher than where we've been operating since the early 2000s. So in every case, um, we are in a situation where there are very large global supplies of all of these crops, and that's pushing prices down. And that's had a huge impact on prices these last couple of years. Huge impact. So that's the main reason why we've seen the shift from high prices to lower prices is that we now have very large supplies relative to usage. On the demand side, going forward, we have a lot of concerns. Um, the biggest one, and there's been a lot in the news lately about what's happening in China, but it's overall uh, weak developing economy uh, growth. Huge concerns about China. Um, as we know, there's also a lot of concern about what's been happening in Brazil. The Brazil economy has weakened substantially. Um, when you think about all of the BRICS, we also have to throw Russia into the mix. The Russia situation is uh, largely a political one, but at the end of the day, it means that the Russia economy is weak. So when we think about uh, those developing economies, there's very weak income growth there. At the same time, we also have a very, very strong U.S. dollar. And so what we see over on the right-hand side is exchange rates that compare the U.S. dollar to the currencies in these different countries. So when we think about our competitors on the selling side, um, Argentina and Brazil are our major competitors in terms of selling um, soybeans. While the Argentina currency has weakened 10 percent relative to the U.S. dollar, the Brazilian real has weakened 40 percent relative to the U.S. dollar. So that, what that means is that Brazil has an advantage when they sell soybeans to the world market. They can price it a lot more competitively just because their currency is weaker than the dollar. In terms of Russia, you can see their currency is down 45%. Um, Russia and that former Soviet Union area, 
that is uh, a major competitor for us on the export markets for both wheat and corn. So they're able to sell at a cheaper price than we are in the U.S. just because of the weaker currency. On the demand side, when we look at buyers, uh, as we all know, China is the largest buyer of soybeans in the world, um, and their currency is down 4%. Uh, we're probably more concerned about what's happening in their general economy than we are about the currency piece, but the currency piece adds another headwind there as well. Uh, the next uh, three countries there on buyers, Japan, Mexico, and Korea, are our three largest corn buyers in that order. And you can see for all of them, their currencies have gotten weaker than the U.S. dollar, or weaker relative to the U.S. dollar. All of that um, causing headwinds for them to purchase uh, corn from the U.S. Uh, so add all of that together, and on the demand side, we are expecting much weaker world demand, which will um, be a challenge for exports of our commodities. Yeah, so you've painted a picture of, of growing worldwide supplies across all these commodities, maybe just a little bit of tightening on the corn side, a weak demand picture, and that doesn't set a very good stage with respect to where U.S. commodity prices are headed over the course of the next growing yeah, season. Yeah, that paints a picture of uh, lower prices. Yeah, it does indeed. Let's take a look at some of the data that USDA released Friday. USDA came out with their updated uh, production estimates for this year, yield estimates, as well as their supply demand estimates. So walk us through that a little bit. Well, I'll start and then I'm going to throw it to Chris Hurt because I know he's been thinking a lot about the details behind this. Um, but that top line number, uh, 2015, the uh, September crop report came out and said 167.5 bushels to the acre, which if we end up realizing that, that will be the second highest yield on record. Um, the other piece to note is it's following last year, 171 bushels to the acre, which was a record crop. And then the year before was a trend yield crop. So we've had three great yields in a row, um, and that paints a picture of a lot of corn out there. But uh, one of the things you had mentioned earlier is that 167.5 bushels to the acre is probably something that a lot of Indiana farmers are going to ask questions about. Yeah, and that's exactly right. In fact, I spoke at a field day on Saturday, and the first question I got was, do I really believe that number? And I think that was coming out of the fact that if you're living here in Indiana, farming in Indiana, maybe western Ohio, uh, you're looking at some pretty tough crops in a lot of places, and it might give us some question about whether or not that's a, a, an accurate projection for 2015. So, Chris, you've looked at that in more detail on a state-by-state -state sure. basis. Well, there's just no question that... Uh, this area you're talking about <clears throat> uh, in the northern part of Indiana and over into Ohio uh, was the worst hit in terms of the flooding of any part of the country. Uh, Indiana was the worst state in terms of the crop quality this summer. Uh, we had about 25 to even close to 30 percent of our corn crop in the worst two conditions, very poor and poor. So it would be natural for uh, producers in those areas to say, uh, this crop has really uh, been hurt and we're not going to have those yields. Um, USDA is saying that the southern uh, reporting districts in Indiana, roughly the southern third of Indiana, are above average, five to about eight percent above trend yields in that part of the state. So even in Indiana we see some areas that have good, if not very good, yields this year. Uh, probably going to be some record yields in parts of Indiana. Uh, the very northern tip of Indiana also has some pretty good yields, but it was kind of from Kankakee, Illinois to south of Fort Wayne and extending into Ohio was the worst of it, and it was bad. So when we look at uh, this year, it's really been a story of two different crops. It's the western corn belt and really the northwestern corn belt because Missouri, the wet areas, Missouri, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio. So as you span across that area, all those yields are below trend and substantially in Indiana. But we have record corn yields then in the northwest part of the Corn Belt, the really big corn states, Iowa, Minnesota, Nebraska, and South Dakota. So those are all record yields. Minnesota, 183 bushels, record yields, highest ever seen. Iowa, 181 bushels, record yields, highest ever seen. Then we start to see that transition. Illinois, 173 bushels. Here in Indiana, 156. So we really have the lowest yields relative to trend. And those are about 7, 8% below what we would have expected at the beginning of the year. So when you put this together, it's always been a struggle all summer long here in Indiana to believe that the national crop could be normal or a little bit above normal this year, as Corrine indicated. Uh, 
crop ratings have indicated that is the case. Uh, so I think if we move along here and look at what does that mean, uh, we look at, uh, as Corrine said, second highest yields ever, a little bit lower uh, acreage for corn this year, but still we see these three really tall bars on the right of a 13.6 billion bushel corn crop following two other corn crops near or above 14 billion bushels. So I think it is this uh, tripling three good years in a row is another one of the factors that we are seeing of uh, keeping prices pretty low. If we look at um, the balance sheet, kind of what does all this mean? I think there were some really encouraging numbers that we saw uh, in the recent update from USDA, and those were reducing the carryovers for the 14 crop, that's represented as the 14-15 marketing year. If you go down to the carryover at 1.732 billion bushels, uh, that was a reduction of about 40 million bushels. As they increased exports, they increased the ethanol crush a little bit, and some non-ethanol uh, uh, food, seed, and industry, industrial use was increased a little bit. So again, these are pretty big numbers, pretty big carryovers, as Corrine said, but to bring them down some and bring them down because of better usage feels pretty positive. Then we go over to the 15-16, that's the crop we will be uh, in harvest mode here very quickly and extending into the marketing year on into calendar 16 and through August of 2016. Uh, there, the USDA brought down the total production, and that was because of lower yields. So those were reduced 1.3 bushels from the August estimate. Uh, and at least that was a direction that I think uh, a lot of Indiana producers thought they would have to come down, and they did come down some. But that was over 100 million bushels there. And with the 40 million less uh, carry-in uh, from the 14 crop, uh, we're over 100 million reduction down on that uh, carry out uh, down around 1.6 billion bushels. And as Kareen indicated, beginning as we bring carryovers down a little bit, a little higher price, USDA is suggesting for the 15 crop 375 a bushel. And again, they uh, do not give the midpoint of that range, they give a range 345 to 405. 375 is the middle of that range. So if you're looking for uh, some improvement in corn price, well, sometimes it has to start with an increment of improvement, and this is a bit of improvement, maybe the start of something that looks uh, just a little bit better. Uh, we've thrown some numbers up on the right. Uh, we're somewhat more optimistic on the feed side. Again, we're looking at grain consuming animal units uh, up about 2.2%. Uh, we might look at USDA's feed number in 1516 coming down a little bit from the 14 crop. Again, with 2.2% more uh, animals on feed, you would think that would have to go up more. Uh, but we do have more sorghum also. So USDA sees more sorghum coming into the feeding. Uh, certainly Eastern Corn Belt producers know the quality of those soft wheat this year had a lot of disease problems and there's going to be uh, more wheat fed. So I don't think we could fuss a lot with USDA at their 5.275 billion bushels of feed, but I think we would put more optimism on that. And Jim, the big increase uh, is cattle on feed, is where USDA is saying we're going to be near 5% more grain consuming animal units on cattle on feed. Now that's more DDGs especially, but I think, again, these are some pretty big numbers, should probably encourage our, our corn feeding. And we're feeding to heavier weights as well. Feeding to heavy weights. We've got these good profitability for uh, the high values of cattle, and that means heavy weights. Those numbers are really up there now, 13, 170 pounds, something in that range. So uh, we would be a little more optimistic. Again, would not fuss with USDA at this point, but we've added a dime there, uh, 350 or so up into the low $4 range. So a little bit of improvement. Uh, the discouraging side is what the total cost is for corn this year and discouraging for those that don't have the yield. Let's look at the prices. Yeah, so uh, a, a pretty friendly kind of a chart here, I think, in term friendly if, if you like a little bit higher corn prices. Um, and 
I think pretty significant uh, bottoming signals being given here. And this is the new crop December futures. Uh, again, look around that 360 where that let red line's drawn. Uh, how many times going back to June and into uh, later June, then testing it again uh, into the middle of August and testing again in early September. And then a really nice recovery. That last uh, observation on the right would be Friday's market. Uh, up another four cents, uh, 391 on the overnights. And so this really feels like a market that's going to try to trade uh, on up around four dollars a bushel on some Dees futures. Again, looking at some pretty strong basis uh, in the Eastern Corn Belt, and, um, and and certainly better than what maybe uh, some anticipation was just a week or so ago. Now, can we go beyond that four dollar mark on the high side? Uh, I think it's going to take uh, the final numbers, as not final, but as we look at the October numbers, uh, our guess is we're going to see lower acreage on corn, bring that down a little bit. If yields don't get higher, I think that builds a little more foundation for some more strength in terms of corn prices. Thinking about that acreage number again, on the previous slide, Chris, on your supply-demand balance sheet, you had production down a little bit compared to USDA, and that's really coming out of an expectation that you think harvested acreage might be a little bit lower than what USDA is currently suggesting. Yeah, that's where that came. I should have mentioned that. Again, prevented planted acreage. Farmers have reported that to FSA, but generally it is the October report when uh, USDA brings that into the acreage numbers. So I think we'll see lower acreage both on corn and probably beans will be lower and I would think a bigger reduction on the soybean numbers than what we see on corn. And that is on harvested acreage and that if yields would stay the same would bring us down a little bit more on production. And again looking at the price chart Chris you're suggesting there might be some modest strength in these futures prices but I think looking at that chart the question some people might have is are we going to go back and challenge that 450 that we put in back in early July? And I think you're suggesting that's not very likely. How quickly we get <laughs> bullish, right? <laughs> that's what we hope for if we're on the production side. No, I think, uh, I think you're really looking at for corn that would have to uh, be sold at harvest time, have to be sold. If you cannot store, uh, that we may see these selling opportunities right now, this week, still pushing up towards that $4 mark. Uh, again, can we go through that? I don't see the fundamentals that are justifying that at this particular time. When you're talking about the futures market, who knows what could happen. Yeah. But it, it would feel like that $4 mark is sort of, um, if you'd just gone back a week ago, getting the chance when you're down at 360, the chance to sell around $4. Uh, I, I think we would see some that have to sell at harvest, cannot store, then this would be an opportunity. Should be looking at that right now. And, and this week, if we get push up towards that level. And thinking about it in percentage terms, that's a roughly a 10% move and not much over a week or 10 days. Well, that's right. And again, I think every producer is going to say, I want more. With the cost structure I have, I want more. Uh, the question is always, what can the market give? And at this point, uh, and remember, if we get into harvest and you get harvest pressure, that can push this market right back down. So again, I think we look at this as a positive opportunity for grain that has to move. Another one we're going to talk about is uh, should we hedge in? Should we go out to the next July if we have storage and hedge in well, this the with the $4 Dece? And, and I think for those that have storage or can get storage, that's worth thinking about. Kareen, let's take a look at the, the storage returns. Storage. You've, storage. You and Chris have okay. taken a look Now again, at we're saying if you have to sell at harvest, looking at this $4 mark on Dece corn, it, time to pull the trigger probably on some of that. But if you have storage, um, that what we've done with this slide is the blue line there is returns to on-farm storage. Um, so what we've looked at is going out into the future, looking at uh, futures bids. Uh, and there's about 24 cents of carry in the futures market. And that's December to July. That's December to July, actually all the way till August it would appear, but December to July. And then taking a look at um, what we anticipate basis appreciation to be. Uh, the, the current cash bids would say basis appreciation is about 15 cents, but we know historically that basis gets stronger as we move into the crop year. So we would anticipate that that basis appreciation would end up being around uh, 25 cents a bushel. So you take into account that total appreciation in cash bids that we anticipate. 
And then for the on-farm storage line there, what we've done is we've subtracted off the number one cost of on-farm storage, which is that opportunity cost of capital of holding the grain as grain rather than converting it into dollars and earning interest. Uh, we've assumed a 3.5% interest charge, but after we've accounted for that interest cost, the on-farm returns to storage are there in the blue line. For commercial storage, this is where you go to a grain elevator and you put the grain into storage. And so in addition to that interest cost that you'll be facing, you would also face uh, 15 cents through December and then uh, 3 cents per bushel per month after that. Um, commercial storage isn't going to be profitable given those charges, but on-farm storage, you can see that Come January and March, uh, you can gain an extra 17 to 19 cents a bushel after interest charges. And going out all the way to June, about 39 cents a bushel potential gain from storage returns on corn for on-farm storage. And just to reiterate, that 39 cents we're showing on the chart is coming out of the current future spread of about 24 cents as of late last week. And then an expectation that cash bids or cash basis would actually increase a little more than what we're showing in the deferred bids right now. Right. Right now, the deferred bids are about a 15 to 20 cent gain, and we expect that to get stronger to around uh, 25 cents. Uh, one of the big changes that has happened here in Indiana is the growth of the ethanol industry, and so that means that we have a lot of processing capacity in the state. And with a really, really weak crop in Indiana, we know that those processors, in order to get the corn, they're going to have to bid a much stronger basis going out to next summer because they're going to have to bid a basis that's strong enough to pull corn from the Western Corn Belt where they have record crops to rail that corn into Indiana to be able to fill their processing needs. So Chris, getting back to the point you made a couple minutes ago, you could think about locking in the futures component of this potential storage return by hedging in the deferred futures, for example, the July futures, to lock that futures price spread in, right. but remain open on the cash side to capture the anticipated improvement in, in cash basis occurring over the course of the winter and, and into early next summer, right? I think that's right. And again, um, uh, if you wanted to sell next July delivery, Corrine's point is that they're not bidding as strongly. The basis appreciation is what we think they probably will. Uh, so the strategy would be if you are willing to accept the basic futures uh, price at this point to go all the way out to July, sell July futures, wait for that basis to get better. Again, we have a number of uh, farms. We One I'm thinking of in particular here in Indiana, we uh, have visited in, in the last couple of years on the farm tour, uh, thinking about a fairly large producer talking about ethanol plants. And when they really get short of corn, uh, they will pop that basis bid pretty substantially to get to his volume. So that's one of the things he waits on. He may be hedged in futures, um, but he waits for that basis pop to come along. So I think that's what we're going to see this year. Uh, again, uh, and not to forward price uh, the basis, but to leave the basis open. And we'll talk more about this later, but if you look at that chart again, you've got 39 cents out there. That's a, a potential improvement in revenue. Uh, and about, that's above interest costs. Yeah, so that's right, on that's farm a, storage. That's a potential improvement in revenue of about 10% or maybe a little better than 10%. And we're going to talk about some strategies later, but this is one of those strategies you can use to and, try. Well, and, and we can start talking about the corn marketing strategies yeah, right now yeah. Yeah. in the yeah. next slide. Well, and again, I think one of the things <laughs> Jim, you're bringing out is that if you just look at the price of corn uh, at harvest time, you say, oh, I can't raise corn for that. But we've got three or four different pieces that we think can add and that actually is going to get that corn final revenue up uh, four and a quarter, maybe four and a half dollars. That's exactly and right. And that's a lot more comfortable than what these bids have looked at, uh, the cash bids for harvest. So, Corrine, let's kind of walk through uh, some of these strategies and discuss them a little bit. All right, so as Chris said, in terms of yields, we're in an Eastern Corn Belt, Western Corn Belt divide. So we're going to see the same thing in terms of basis patterns. Because of the um, small crop in the Eastern Corn Belt, we're seeing that there's plenty of storage capacity. There's abundant storage capacity. So there's going to be no competition in terms of uh, trying to find storage space. So what that means is we expect a pretty strong harvest basis in the Eastern Corn Belt. But in the Western Corn Belt, because of their record crops, there's going to be very tight storage supplies, which means that they'll have a much weaker harvest basis. So when we think about those storage returns, um, for both the East and the West, there's that 24 cent carry in the futures market. For the Eastern Corn Belt, because we have that strong harvest basis, we anticipate about 25 cents in basis appreciation by early spring or spring to early summer. 
For the West, largely because their harvest basis is going to be so weak, we anticipate that that basis appreciation is going to be about 10 cents larger to 30 to 35 cents of basis appreciation for the Western Corn Belt. So in the Eastern Corn Belt, the storage returns would be on the order, or the carry in the market is on the order of uh, 45 to 50 cents, and that's not including the, that interest cost. Um, and then on the Western Corn Belt, it's 50 to 60 cents of carry. For the Eastern Corn Belt, because of the flooding and the wet weather and the really bad yields, uh, there are going to be crop insurance opportunities that we'll talk about more on the next slide. We also have a potential, this is what Chris was saying, there's potential to add to the corn price that farmers are going to be facing from the county ARC payments. Um, so we think there will be strong potential for these county ARC payments. Of course, they won't get paid until October 2016. And I, Jim, both you and Chris have looked at the details of these county ARC payments. Um, we have, and there's going to be some variability on in the payments that occur here in the fall of 15 based on the 14 crop. Of course, our estimates for, for the 15 crop payable in 16 are being driven by average expectations at this point, so there's more uniformity, but we'll talk about that more in a minute. But uh, Chris, I think, you know, looking, at, looking ahead to, to 2016, really looking a year ahead, uh, your expectation, corn acres in 16, probably about the same as, as in 15? Yeah, we'll look at a budget here in a little bit. Uh, what we're finding is uh, the current bids, we use Friday's close uh, bids for new crop 16 now we're talking about. Corn and beans were pretty equivalent. Uh, and so not a strong incentive to shift acreage from where we were uh, here in 2015. Again, it's very early to be talking about 16, but on the other hand, uh, fall fertilizer, fall tillage, some decisions about at least general direction of plantings for 16 does have to be made here coming up in the next 60 days. Um, we'll go back just a little bit on those 2015 uh, ARC County payments. Uh, we're about 98% of the uh, corn and soybean base uh, in the Eastern Corn Belt and the Western Corn Belt went into the ARC County program. So for government programs, that's primarily what we'll talk about. A few went into PLC, but it's a small number on corn and soybeans. And so our, uh, in the East, uh, you know, we've both looked at that and there's lots of variation of what payments uh, you would get from your 15 ARC County uh, payments. Um, and again, we might back up a little bit and even talk about the 14 county ARC payments. I guess we should mention that because that is... And that's really where the variability is that, at this point. That's correct. And uh, let's, let's sort of go back to 14. Those would be the ones coming uh, here this fall in October of, of 15. Uh, and Jim, what uh, we've looked at is that if you're yields were high and in Indiana as an example we had some really high county yields last year probably not going to be any uh, 2014 corn arc payments but we do have counties where there's going to be very substantial payments maybe sixty dollars so this uh, you're just we're uh, going to have to see where FSA comes out on yields the 14 yields for the counties uh, they are not going to do that until sometime here in September, but um, uh, this is another potential payment that's coming. Now let's talk about the 15s. The 15 with uh, the yields more average or below average, there's where we're going to see very high payments on corn and probably soybeans for the 15 crop that are going to come in 16, October 16. That's right, and so just to reiterate, I think when we look at individual counties, again, based on an estimate of the NAS yields, or using the NAS yields right. as a, an expectation for what FSA will use it for the final county yields, we're gonna see payments on corn in Indiana that range from zero uh, to a few counties that it's probably gonna be close to hitting the cap. Yeah. Um, so Which would bit, be up around $70 or so. And I, and I think if you haven't paid close attention to the Arc County program, it's important to note that those payments do vary by county. And this is a big change relative to prior farm programs. We didn't do that previously. This is going to be a year where those payments, and this is a program where those payments do vary by county. And that's going to continue throughout the program. Uh, but you're right then as we look at 15 in Indiana and the counties that were hardest hit, the potential mm -hmm. for sizable payments a year from now is, is pretty good uh, coming out of really both sides of the equation, the price side of the equation as well as the yield side of the equation. So, so this is one of those helpers that's out there. We've got the low prices in the market, but 
the government program payments from the 14 and the 15 crops, those can be really helpful, especially for some counties. Now, we had a question from a viewer, and, and Corrine mentioned this earlier, the crop insurance situation. Let's take a look at that. I think that's on the next slide. So here's some, some estimates of potential crop insurance payments for both corn and beans, looking at uh, both yield, potential yield reductions relative to the APH and also the impact of prices. And Chris, you've got some of those colored in in yellow, and that kind of <coughs> highlights what's going on here, right? right. Um, again, what we're looking at is uh, most of the, the biggest single program are uh, revenue-based programs that producers elect for corn and soybeans. And so we're looking at uh, revenue crop insurance. Let's just start with corn and 85% coverage up on that top row. Again, the base price was established back in the spring. And that is uh, based upon the December futures for corn, the November new crop futures for soybeans. Now we'll be looking at, uh, the for final payments, we'll be looking at the December corn price or the November soybean price in the month of October. So it's really relevant to look right now what are those November beans and December futures corn. Uh, we'll follow on that top row over to uh, the right-hand four columns for what are your 200, 2015 yields. If you're exactly at the APH, uh, I was just using kind of an average Indiana 170 bushels, you'd have to have, with an 85% coverage, you'd have to have prices down to 353 a bushel on December corn. Now, this morning on the overnights, we were 391 a bushel. So, very unlikely uh, given where futures markets are, that 85% would trigger if you had fairly normal yields. On the other hand, let's go to the 10% under APH yields. Uh, and in Indiana, we're certainly going to have a lot of farms, even on an enterprise basis, in these hard-hit flooded areas where they're going to be 10% or lower. You would trigger at 392. Uh, the futures market uh, on the overnights tonight, or this morning, we're 391. So again, you're looking at, if with 85% coverage, if we'd have an October, December futures at that 391, 392, where you would start to get payments. Clearly, if you have lower yields than that, uh, you would get payments. And again, if we drop down to 75% protection uh, revenue product, 389, again, that would just about be at a triggering level with the futures right now. So I think the point of that is that uh, those who have some larger losses uh, on corn, um, certainly insurance can be one of the factors that really can help hold the farm together. That's the design of crop insurance in terms of our federal uh, safety net policy. It's not to cover all the loss, it's to cover the catastrophic loss, that huge portion that if they lost all of that, it, they might not farm next year. Soybeans, uh, the overnights, $8.82. Just look at an 85% coverage with a 10% uh, loss this year and uh, yields 10% under your APH. And uh, with current prices, $8.82, you'd be looking at insurance payments with a 10% loss and 85% coverage. So again, I think what we're saying is we're not going to work through the economics of that, but for some in the Eastern Corn Belt, that have really gotten hit on yields, crop insurance is going to be uh, a help. The other thing this chart I think illustrates, Chris, is you know last spring we talked and last winter we talked about the importance of carrying a high level of crop insurance coverage, and I think this chart also illustrates why we were advocating a lot of people at least think about carrying the 85 percent coverage instead of the 70 or 75 percent coverage. Uh, really well, makes a difference. And uh, after you have a loss, that's when you recognize, I wish I had more insurance. Yeah. So we, this is a basic truism. It's the cash outflow in a year where cash was hard to come up with to pay those higher premiums. And it gives you the certainty of, of that level of revenue. And I think we're six months away from making the crop insur insurance decisions for 16, but again, I think that's going to be a strategy we're going to want to look at for, for calendar year 16. Let's turn our attention and, and uh, spend a little more time looking at the soybean situation. Uh, Corrine, I think uh, the yield picture looks a little bit like what we saw with corn. It does. Um, right now, the USDA's forecast is that our national soybean yield is going to be 47.1 bushels to the acre. And you can see from that chart, that's going to be the second highest yield ever. 
Um, and in particular, there's a number of states that have record yields, including Iowa, Minnesota, and then even in the Eastern Corn Belt more, we've got Michigan and Kentucky as well listed as having uh, record yields. Um, Indiana, we are looking at a, right now, the best guess is a 50 bushels to the acre yield for Indiana. So when you look at production, what that means is we have uh, the second highest production on record, uh, pretty much close to what we had last year, um, almost 4 billion bushels of soybeans nationally. So again, we're in a situation with very burdensome supplies. And uh, you know, I think one of the things that we've seen the last couple of years is bean prices have been relatively higher than corn prices. This has drawn more land to soybeans and as you would guess, markets over time work back towards that equilibrium. And so as Jim, you mentioned earlier, we're looking at the finally the 16 crop, those kind of back in alignment. Soybean prices have kind of come down to be roughly equivalent to corn prices. Uh, and so I think this transition, what we see in markets is, is over time working back towards equilibrium and that's occurred. And, and you're right, if you look back even a little further, of course, in much of the Corn Belt, we'd shifted the other way. The way and with the ethanol demand, when that was surging, we were shifting acreage into corn. And if you think about it from kind of a long run standpoint, a lot of uh, Corn Belt farms that had perhaps shifted into a strategy instead of planting 50-50 corn and beans, uh, had gone to maybe more of a two-thirds corn or in some cases even higher than that That's right. uh, with a lower corn, uh, soybean acreage, we're shifting back. We're back, we're back in a more long-term kind right. of relationship where a lot of farms <clears throat> are probably going to operate on, on something closer to a 50-50 corn and soybean split the next few years. And it, as you go forward, you know, you think uh, the priority really shifts a little bit more to beans. And why is that? Well, the ethanol use for corn is pretty well plateaued, just slight growth in that. But over on the soybean side, the big driver's Chinese buying beans. And again, Corrine's brought up some questions there, but, yeah. but if they continue to be big bean buyers and growing, that would increase the bean acreage. And then biodiesel on the biofuel side, that's where EPA is stimulating the usage, not on corn, but on biodiesel. So we could see over time, if China continues to be that big buyer. I, I think everybody expects China to, that. China is a long-term big buyer and would continue to grow. And right now we're in a pause phase. And yeah. you know how long that pause lasts and what that means for the soybean market. Um, we'll learn more right. as the months unfold. And to put that in perspective, I think uh, if you look at exports last year, China took about two thirds of our bean exports, That's right. right? That's correct. Mm -hmm. So it's a very important customer. And it's so something we're gonna pay close attention to. Kind of the name of the game, I think, in terms of price as well too, how aggressive China is as a buyer uh, is largely gonna determine what happens in terms of soybean prices. Uh, we just look at uh, kind of the numbers that USDA gave us uh, on Friday. And we'll start with the 1415 crop. Um, and I remember the, the trade really went in pretty bearish on soybeans and uh, came out of uh, Friday's uh, results, trading lower right after the report, but clawing the way back to unchanged. And again, that's usually a pretty good signal that uh, when you get a f uh, some numbers that the trade treats bearish right off the bat, but then can claw back, get back to break even, uh, really pretty, pretty friendly indicators. What was friendly about the soybeans was reduction of the carry over uh, 210 million bushels. That had been at 230. So uh, in the final estimate, USDA increased uh, exports was the primary uh, reason why we saw greater usage and lower carry out. That lower carry out then from the 14 crop goes over to the 15, 16 uh, in the blue column. And uh, there we also had a 20 million bushel reduction in the final uh, carryover from 470 to 450. So while these are still very big numbers, uh, roughly 12% stocks to use for the 15-16 marketing year, uh, USDA uh, left the midpoint of the range at $9.15. Now remember we were probably uh, down in the eight and a half to 860 range on on futures, on new crop beans, that's pretty substantially below where USDA has been on season average prices. Uh, we'll just look at our numbers a little bit more optimistic. 
and we've got that optimism based on somewhat lower production. And again, that's because we uh, continue to believe there could be four to five hundred million, four to five hundred thousand acres uh, come out of the soybean harvested acreage, uh, prevented planting, and then just drowned out areas that don't get harvested. That just isn't built yet into the USDA numbers. So some lower production, uh, not fussing too much with usage. I guess we've got crush a little bit higher there, but somewhat lower carryouts, and that would be more stimulative towards prices getting back towards uh, $9.50 a bushel. So I, I think we see some potential for optimism. And if we can look at the next visual, I think we've got a, yeah, there's the chart. So there's that trading down to 850, the very right hand side of that chart. Maybe not totally convinced yet that that is the bottom, but uh, certainly technicians would look at that double bottling, bottoming down around $8.50 a bushel. Uh, then coming back, uh, this is Friday's market over on the very right hand side, uh, unchanged as, um, uh, as, as a potential indicator. Now, to really say that we've bottomed, you'd like to see that get back above uh, about 880 a bushel, those highs of the last couple of weeks. And if we can get through that, uh, then I think technically you'd say this market probably has reached a bottom at this point. Well, and the overnights were at 882, so that's always a good yeah, sign. Yeah, so again, but... follow through to the upside. Uh, again, a market that was poised to make, if the report came in big production, make break through that 850. Uh, so I, I think it feels a lot better this morning than it did Friday morning with a lot of nervousness. And probably what we're seeing is uh, a number of traders went into the market short, thinking that was going to be a, a bearish report. Uh, it did not turn out that way, and so you kind of see this reversal of opinion. Some of those shorts saying, just get me out, buy back those positions. Now, can we get real bullish uh, on beans? Um, you know, uh, that 940 mark, you can kind of see where that's at. And basically, going up to our last uh, high is on up around $10 on soybeans. So I, I think you kind of come through this report saying, uh, okay, now maybe we're not going to have a super, super sized bean crop. Maybe there's going to be some weather problems in South America. Uh, we do have an El Nino in place. Could that be a concern and get us some rally in this market? So I, I think there's just a more optimistic feel to the bean market today versus uh, Friday's, uh, Friday's open. But if you think about the big picture, and Corrine and I were discussing this Friday afternoon, we've gone through several years where we had that uh, stocks to usage ratio below 5%. Or now even last year was 5.4%. That 210 million bushels from last year, very tight stocks to use ratio. And that's more than double to where it, uh, USDA's numbers have us at a 12% stocks to use ratio. We haven't seen supplies on that level for eight years or so. That's right, so and, and again, when we look there. at the world numbers for the 15-16 marketing year, that includes the South American crop that will just be planted. So a lot of weather issues can happen also in South America. Now that can be with higher yields and it can be lower yields, but um, we're, we're certainly not assured with the South Americans being bigger producers than the United States now, we're not assured that the world carryover numbers are going to be that high. So uh, that leaves room for being two sides of the market, bullish and bearish. All right, so we'll, let's take a look at that storage decision then. Yeah, really um, favorable for <laughs> corn on farm. What about was, the beans? So for beans, we did the exact same calculation. So the on farm storage, the number one cost to on farm storage again is that opportunity cost of storage at 3.5% interest. And so for the on farm storage, we've taken those uh, futures bids uh, and the appreciation in the cash market that we anticipate, or the appreciation in the basis, added that together, subtracted off the interest costs, and you can see that we've got uh, storage returns on the order of 16 cents to March and maybe 21 cents to June. For commercial storage, uh, it really doesn't pay for soybeans. Uh, once you start adding on those commercial storage charges, we really do not see any positive returns to storage. But if you go and you compare, storage returns for soybeans and corn on the next slide. On on-farm storage. On on-farm storage. Uh, since on-farm storage is the profitable one for both corn and for soybeans, uh, 
Farmers have bins and they have a choice of what they put into those bins, whether it's corn or soybeans. And typically, this is what we see almost every year. Uh, typically, the returns to storage of corn outpace the returns to storage of soybeans. So if you have a choice of what you're going to deliver at harvest uh, versus what you're going to put into storage, we would say store corn first um, and store soybeans second if you have plenty of space. Of course, this year in the Eastern Corn Belt, because of the smaller crops, there will be plenty of space and maybe farmers will be in an opportunity of storing both corn and soybeans. And probably uh, we should uh, at least put a footnote on that. It's going to even depend on the area of Indiana in the Eastern Corn Belt. There are some areas that have above average yields. So right. there may be some that have to make choices between corn and soybeans. And, that, and that's especially true if we think of, for example, southwest Indiana that's where right. crop conditions are actually pretty actually good. Actually look pretty good yields in that area. So I think area is going to make some difference this year. All right, let's take a look at our marketing strategies a little bit here. Green, you want to kick that off? All right, so as we've been painting this picture, uh, because uh, South America is now the largest producer of soybeans, soybean prices are more vulnerable to um, what's going to happen in terms of that South American production. If that South American production is really good, that will put additional downward pressure on soybean prices in the U.S. If they have, uh, if they get hurt by El Nino um, or other weather events, then that could be bullish for U.S. soybean prices. As we've said again and again, uh, China bought two thirds of the U.S. soybean um, exports last year, so soybean prices are more vulnerable to what's happening in China and other world economic conditions relative to corn. And then, uh, Chris, uh, you've been tracking what's happening with El Nino. Well, yeah, and again, we're looking for, uh, and I should say the weather people are looking for a very strong El Nino, maybe near record proportions this year. And uh, that does tend to have pretty, be correlated with poor palm oil production, uh, Malaysia. Uh, so certainly that could be one of the links. You, you tighten up world uh, vegetable oil supplies through palm oil. That could really help the soybean oil side of things. Uh, could have impacts in South America, although we tend to not expect necessarily that it's more wheat uh, in parts of Australia that it affects. Uh, but El Nino, we're going to hear a lot of discussion uh, going late this year and often peaks out around the Christmas time period. It, it creates an additional level of uncertainty regarding That's correct. production and, around the and world. And again, I think as Corrine's pointed out, the world has just been a pretty um, uh, place that we haven't had a lot of variation the past two or three years in production. So we all know that isn't going to continue, uh, that we're going to have some major growing areas at some point that have some shortness of crop and certainly that can give us some upside potential. Now you hate to base your marketing program just based on maybe somebody else will have a problem, but I think an El Nino says there could be more weather disruptions than we would in a normal winter have. So that kind of wraps up the storage returns, but you're also talking about if you're not going to store commercially and you don't have on-farm storage, your strategy is suggesting you might think about selling cash at harvest and maybe replacing that if you want to speculate a little bit. Right. So if you want to capture the carry in the futures market, you can always sell at harvest, uh, deliver the grain, and then uh, replace that ownership with a, a call option or with a futures position. Um, so. You can always do that as a way in which to capture or carry in the market. Um, we've already discussed what's happening with crop insurance and right. potentially depending on what individual uh, farm yields are, there could be some crop insurance for soybeans in the Eastern Corn Belt. Um, and then we have the same situation with the ARC payments as you've been describing. So areas with either normal or low yields in 2015 can potentially anticipate a strong ARC county payment that would come next October 2016. Um, and that's going to depend, of course, on what your county yields are. And in areas where there's strong yields, there won't be a payout. But in areas where there's very poor yields, there could be a substantial payout. Yeah, and, and looking back to the 14 crop with those payments that potentially would be due here in the fall of 15, uh, the payments on the soybean side of the equation out of the 14 crop in most cases are going to be very small. Right, zero. For yeah, most so part. most ca most Indiana County is zero. A few of the positive, but even the ones that are positive on a per acre basis are going to be very small. So probably not a lot of help uh, out of that part of the program. Uh, speaking of that, we did have a question from a viewer. A story showed up last week talking about the possibility of USDA reducing 
uh, the ARC County payments and actually farm program payments in general as a result of the budget discussions, or actually I should say the failure to pass a budget in Washington by roughly 7.3%. What's the likelihood of that? Do we have a handle on that? I don't. I don't. Think I, I don't think I do for sure. And uh, apparently, the policy pieces I've read um, are are not sure which way that's going to go. And again, the fiscal year for the government ends at the end of September, and my understanding is sequestration takes 7.2 percent out of all payments that are 15, which would be in September through September, but in October payments. Those would be 6.8% sequestration reduction. Now, uh, we don't even know the 15 or the 14 ARC payments, if they're made in budget year 16, would they be subject to 7.2 or 6.8? I don't know that. And the policy pieces I've read said that's not clear. Whether they will be in place uh, and whether it be for the, for the 15 or the 16 budget year. But I think the point is, they may be backed up some, something around 7%. Yeah, I think that's the risk, and that right now we've got two more weeks for this to play out basically before the end of the budget year. So we don't know for sure, but I think there is a chance there could be a, a reduction in those yeah. payments based I on the budget I think the administration's problems. on the side of saying let's do away with sequestration. Um, again, how this plays out through Congress, we'll have to see. Yeah, we'll have to wait and see on that here over the next, uh, next few weeks. All right, let's talk... Uh, a little bit about the cost side of the equation, so and especially looking ahead to uh, to 2016. Corrine, you want to kick that one off? All right. So on this slide, uh, we've taken the Purdue uh, crop budget for average quality land for corn, and uh, figured out what the total budgeted costs are per bushel going back to 2005. Um, and I think this paints a really clear picture of just how much costs have increased since 2005. So if you use that as a benchmark. From 2005, uh, the cost per bushel was $2.70 a bushel, and for 2015, 10 years later, we're at $4.99. That's almost double. Um, and then taking a look at where the budget's going for 2016, those costs are starting to come down, but right now the Purdue budget is saying that we're at $4.70 a bushel, so coming down about 30 cents. Now we want to point out these are total cost. These are total and costs. And that includes variable cost. That includes cash rent for every acre. It includes depreciation on machinery and family living expense. So this becomes the real question, which one of those is going to get paid because these total costs are clearly above where the revenues are at. So before we get to our last slide of all or our last slide of all of our strategies and what we can do, it's worth taking a look at our estimated crop budget for 2016 and just taking a look at where those returns are. So for this slide, we took the futures closes at the end of the day on Friday. Um, so harvest futures for uh, corn for 2016. So December 2016, corn futures at $4.10. November 2016, soybean futures at 866. And July 2016, wheat futures at 503. We subtract off our anticipated harvest basis at those times to come up with our anticipated cash price for 2016. We take that price times anticipated yields for each of these different qualities of land to come up with total revenue, and then we subtract off of that our estimated variable cost per acre from the Purdue crop budget for 2016. So what's left there in the table below in those numbers that are highlighted, that's what we call the contribution margin. That's that estimated returns per acre above variable costs that's there to contribute to those fixed expenses, things like cash rent and machinery and labor. Um, in the top right corner, you can see that cash rent, that average $216, $213 an acre. Machinery and labor, we've estimated $144 an acre. So total sort of overhead costs on that side of $357 an acre with then the contribution margin contributing towards that. Again and again through this, we've been saying that we think farmers will be going more towards a 50-50 corn soybean rotation, and that comes directly from this table. When you take a look at average quality land there in the middle, we can see that for average quality land, the return to corn in rotation with soybeans is estimated to be $203 an acre contribution margin, and for soybeans, $201 an acre contribution margin. And both of those are substantially higher than a continuous corn rotation or a single crop wheat rotation. So we think farmers will um, plant the most profitable rotation for average quality land being a 50-50 corn bean rotation with the returns being about equal. 
And I think it says that's the equilibrium. There's just not a lot of difference uh, based on Friday's prices between corn and soybeans on that average quality land. Well, and this is valuable because at different periods going back, we have seen when there was a lot of pressure to increase corn prices, we would see this contribution margin for corn pay as much as $70 to $100 an acre more That's than correct. what it was for right. soybeans. Or, and then last year for soybeans, we saw it paying, what, $60, $70 an acre more than for corn. For beans. Right. And for we beans. saw that shift to more beans and less corn yeah. nationally. Yeah. So what this chart does is it's a pretty good predictor of where we think acreages are going to go. And this tells us that that 50-50 corn bean or acreage being similar going forward um, comes directly from this chart. Now, I will say separately that uh, when we do these charts, this contribution margins are substantially smaller than what we've seen in the past. And so, but that just adds to that story of we are in that dilemma zone where costs are certainly above where revenues are. So let's talk about what we can do. Well, just uh, a long list. I think uh, most people are very aware, well aware of these uh, things that producers can do, but reduce capital purchases. We've seen that already. Cut family living expenses, liquidate excess assets, uh, some machinery that's not being used, uh, uh, other things that maybe aren't uh, being used. Uh, obviously, we're seeking lower cost inputs additional farm-related income, off-farm income, pursue reduced cash rents. Uh, we think that's going to be one of the really important topics this fall and winter, trying to get cash rents lower. Uh, obviously, this combination, looking at not just the market to give us a return, but the market, uh, also what can crop con insurance do for us, the government payments can be very important, FSA disaster loans, obviously very important. Uh, it's the year of the lender again, and obviously we're going to be short on cash flow for many fam families in the farming business this year, and especially those that have had low yields. And so the lender is going to be very important. Restructuring the time periods on loans can be helpful. Uh, not repaying a full operating loan uh, this year in some cases. Increasing borrowing against those real assets like real estate. So lots of things we can do. We've got several publications, Jim, you have on the website uh, that perhaps you can mention that go through this list and even more extensively. But I think then we kind of come down to, we've got to get through this year, but then really think about this as a time period that we're going to talk about low margins or even negative margins. And we've got to have not just a one-year plan, but especially if you're working with the lender, uh, two, three, up to five year plan to get through this until we can see costs get back in alignment with revenues. Yeah, good point, Chris. And, mm -hmm. and you know, as I think about strategies that you really need to think about in the short run, uh, number one is to visit with your lender very soon. Uh, if you need to restructure, and I think a lot of people probably do, uh, the time to do it is now. Don't wait until you're actually up against the wall, so to speak, and that's going to be very difficult because of the regulatory environment we're in. If you're a little uh, preemptive and do it up front and do it early, mm -hmm. stretch out repayment terms uh, on some assets, whether it be farmland or perhaps some farm machinery uh, debt that you might have, now's the time to do that, to work your way through these next three or four years, which we think are going to be pretty challenging for most people. Um, well, I, I think it's important to add, I mean, we've painted this picture of large global supplies, and when you end up with large global supplies and inventories, then there's a buffer there. Even if the world were to have a bad soybean crop or a bad wheat crop, we have the global inventories to buffer that. So we won't be seeing those price spikes with small supply problems the way we did in the recent years when we had much tighter global inventories. Yeah, that's, that's so, a good point. So, you know, we're looking at a world where once you get those really large inventories globally, you're in a place where you're just not going to see pr prices be as variable as what they have been. Or maybe another way to say that is if your cost is really high, like five or five and a half dollars, don't expect a, a short crop in some other growing area to get you back up consistently to that level. Now maybe instead of 375 you get to four, four and a quarter, four and a half, but don't expect it to get you way up there. Yeah. Good point. The other thing I, I guess I really wanted to mention, Chris, was uh, uh, we, you mentioned pursuing reduced cash rents. One of the things that we just released uh, late last week on our website is a spreadsheet that was uh, built jointly with uh, Gary Schnitke over at the University of Illinois. And it allows you to look at 
changes in cash rent and the impact that the cash rent you're paying in 2016 and beyond uh, would actually have on your operation. And of course, this is really one of the challenges for a lot of farms. Uh, they'd like to see cash rents come down, but if the landlord's not willing to reduce that rate in the short run, what choice do I have? If I lose that farm in 2016, I might not have a chance to farm that again in subsequent years. And so what this spreadsheet allows you to do is, is view that as sort of an option. Uh, you're really literally paying sort of an option premium to retain the right to farm that operate or that land for several years. It allows you to look at it as, as, as more of an option type payment and then as, assess what impact that has on your working capital because that's really the critical variable the next several right. years. So I'd encourage you to, to visit our website. As Chris mentioned, we do have a lot of information on the Center for Commercial Agriculture's website. We actually have a section called, I think it's called Managing Your Way Through the Downturn or Through the Financial Downturn in Agriculture where we've aggregated a, a lot of different pieces that you might want to take a look at. And that includes the spreadsheet that, that I just mentioned, as well as an article that accompanies that and, and explains how that works. So we would encourage you to visit the Center for Commercial Ag uh, website. The easiest way to find that is in your favorite search engine. Just type Purdue Center for Commercial Ag, and it should pop up number one in your search engine's uh, results. And with that, uh, I really want to thank you for joining us today. Uh, we do have another webinar coming up. We've got webinars scheduled all the way out through next spring. Uh, you can check those out on our, on our website. But the next one is scheduled for October 30th, uh, where we're going to take a really long-range outlook uh, for the ag economy. So this year, or this webinar really focused on the shorter run outlook uh, with the current crop situation, looking out through the winter and into the early spring. We're going to take more of a multi-year uh, outlook uh, perspective on that October 30th webinar. Chris Hurt will be joining us as well as, uh, I think, Jason Henderson, Henderson our uh, director of Purdue Extension and former economist with the uh, Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City, uh, Michael Langemeyer, and I think Mike Bolgi will be here for that Great. discussion. So it be be, should be a, a fun discussion uh, regarding what's likely to take place, not only in the ag economy, but also in the U.S. economy a little bit as well. So again, thank you for joining us uh, on today's webinar, and we'll look forward to the opportunity to visit with you again in the future. Thank you very much.